In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Faith without works is dead. This quote is from a controversial book. It's from a book in the Bible, but from one that almost didn't make it into the Bible. It's from a book Martin Luther called a book of straw because he thought it challenged the all-important role of God's grace, which we can never earn or deserve. The quote is from the book of James. And I kept hearing it this week as I read and prayed our Lord's story about these two brothers. This parable from Jesus follows a classic format. It's a story about two brothers. Remember the story of the prodigal son? It's a story about a vineyard. Remember the parable of the laborers in the vineyard? And on and on. The context of this parable is that it's told directly to challenge the chief priests and elders after they have challenged Jesus about his authority. Part of the power of Jesus' parables, of course, like this one, is that they force us to ask, which character are we? Are we the one who refuses to follow Jesus, but then does anyway? Or are we the one who says all of the right things and then doesn't ever follow through on them? And why does Jesus say the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom before these religious leaders? Well, it may be because tax collectors and prostitutes don't argue with the point that they need to change. They don't believe they're self-sufficient or that they're all right just as they are. Tax collectors were hated by pretty much all of the people. They cooperated with the Romans in collecting taxes from the Jewish people. They had to collect extra on top, sort of a handling charge, if you will, to make their living. They were even considered ritually impure because of the nature of their work. They were used to being thought of as scum. And it's hard not to internalize that belief when everyone reminds you all the time that you are, in fact, scum. The same holds true for the prostitutes. There's no pretense to righteousness or worthiness there. It gets much more complicated, though, for the religious leaders. Those who, for all of the right reasons, work hard to make the temple all that it can be, what it should be, what they believe God is calling them to ensure. They have a responsibility, after all, a responsibility given to them by God on behalf of the people. It might become a little harder for them to be open to being called on their stuff to being remade, to being told where they might have said yes, but then didn't follow through in their lives. The point needs to be made that both of these sons disappointed their father, didn't they? The ideal, of course, is to have both say, yes, I will work in the vineyard, and for the father then to be able to look around in a bit and see them gathering up the tools they will need and actually getting to work. The first refuses outright. Nope, ain't going to do it. Why, we wonder? Is it pure contrariness? Or might it be a sense of having lost his purpose, or even all purpose, or doubting that he can make a difference? You can almost hear him say, I'd rather stay on the couch with the remote and eat Doritos. Or maybe worse, I don't deserve to work in the vineyard, Father. I've messed up too much. You really need somebody better. But then maybe, 
from the couch while he's munching on the Doritos. He looks out toward the vineyard and he sees the work that needs to be done, the weeds growing up, how dry and parched it is, the fence that needs to be mended. And he says, well, yeah, I, I can do that. I'll do just a little. And as he does just a little, he starts to feel better about himself. He sees that he is making a difference, and maybe he's being changed in the process. What of the other son, the more respectable one? Well, of course, he lets the father down, too. He says, I'll go, and then he doesn't. He signs up for a ministry, but then never answers the email. Maybe he decides the vineyard is actually in pretty good shape already. And actually, he's in pretty good shape already. So he toss around a word in church, probably without defining it enough. And that word is discipleship. To be a disciple of someone is to follow someone. To learn all that you can about that person so that your life and your following becomes like the one you're following more and more. Walking the walk, you might say. Not words only, but words followed by action. I worry that the church doesn't make this practical enough, this discipleship thing. I worry that we don't hold up some of the classical elements of what it means to be a disciple often enough. Even for those of you who've been practicing this walk all your life, even you might need to be reminded. What are some of the classical elements of being a follower of Jesus? The first we're doing right now is worshiping. Lots of different ways to do it, but it requires showing up. It requires showing up with an open heart and an open mind and, I would say, a willingness to admit that we need to be changed. Witnessing, evangelism, letting folk know that we believe, that this matters to us, that our faith is not purely a polite, private thing to be kept behind closed doors but that it is meant to influence all that we are and all that we do. Humbly witnessing, not in your face, arrogant, offensive, but being responsive, especially when someone approaches you and asks what you believe and why. Giving. Constantly from a grateful heart, offering back to God's use a portion of our time, our talent, and our treasure, all that God's given us to God's purposes in the church, but also in the world. Sharing. You might also call this outreach. Having a heart for those who are hurting and doing what we can to meet them in that hurt in the name of Jesus. Caring. You might call this pastoral care. Reaching out, listening, doing what we can to help brothers and sisters who might be in need. Whether it's a ride to the doctor or a meal or a casserole, whatever it might be. Learning. You might call this Christian education. Learning at least the basics of our story. Who we believe God to be. How we believe God to interact with us and care for us. What forgiveness is. What redemption is. What new life is. What sin is. And how we need not be caught in it. What are some of the examples of the saints and the martyrs? The lessons from our history. Learning. Practicing justice looking around and being reminded that the world is not yet as God dreams. Asking in what way we can help contribute to God's justice in the world. A couple of ways that's on our minds right now among so many 
is how can we be part of racial healing and reconciliation? And how can we help in some way in caring for our planet? I'm thinking of one small example, and it's all about intention. As you know, we are now collecting little plastic recycling bag, bags for recycling that don't recycle in our normal collection. What might you think as you drop bags in that container? I would say to try to stretch. Not that just that it feels good or even that it's the right thing to do, but that on some level we're helping to take care of God's creation. And I think that intention makes all the difference. Joining. Joining. Gathering in our fellowship, learning from each other, laughing together, crying together, being challenged together, being inspired by the walk of a brother or sister as we wonder, if I were going through what they're going through, would I even be able to stand here? And yet there they are. Repenting. Repenting simply means turning. Again, intention as we approach the general confession in a few moments. I think the key is how we approach it. I actually had a parishioner in a church long ago and far away tell me that their problem with the general confession was that it assumed we'd all fallen short, that we had something to confess. And I said, well, most of us do. Um, maybe you're on the path to sainthood, but for most of us, it's a regular inventory. It's regular work. How have I fallen short of God's dream this week? Of whom have I taken advantage? What half-truth have I told? With what prejudices have I approached others of God's children? Where have I just decided to sit on the couch and eat Doritos? Not that there's not a time and a place for that. You see, the vineyard in this parable is the world. The vineyard is the ultimate mission field. A world God loves. A world that's hurting. A world to which we are sent to make a difference and to proclaim. Now, most all of us have on occasion said yes, like that one son, and then didn't show up. Most all of us likewise have said no because we didn't feel worthy or up to a task. After all, God could surely call someone more qualified, more equipped. But then we looked around and we decided that maybe after all we could pull a few weeds or serve on a committee or the vestry or sing in the choir or after asking a friend and co-worker how they really were doing, maybe we could ask if they were ever possibly open to joining us at church. Maybe we decide we really need to examine how much we give away and why, and maybe we need to look at why we get so triggered by that one particular person. And then before we know it, we're off to the races and we're showing up even when we said we wouldn't. God can work with that. A main point that needs to be made here. Jesus isn't saying it's only people like the tax collectors and prostitutes who will enter the kingdom, just that they might get there first. To say that someone else is getting there before me doesn't mean that I'm not going there too just that I might take a while longer. I might be with that great group bringing up the rear. God can work with that too. I think there's some good news in that. There's some challenge in that. Then there's a key question in all of this. It was a question Jesus had for the chief priests and the elders. It was a question before both of these sons in the parable, and it's a question for us. With what works, by God's grace, are we backing up our faith? Amen.